The evolution of media has gone on for a while. And we went from film to digital cameras that had grainy sort of pictures to now the resolution that you can get again on an iPhone allows people to generate their own content that would have been unheard of with the most professional equipment 20 years ago. It's amazing to see how we've gone from the PC, which used to be our only way of connecting to the internet. And then we started moving to mobile phones away from the tether of a wired connection. The next step, it was almost predestined that eventually we would go to devices that would have the same power that phones had in the past. It would go from the fact that we went from a desktop to we went to a phone and something that followed you around to something that was stayed but can operate on its own separately. And at some point in time, the ability for these devices to connect to one another, that's where things are really going to go with the next step. What is engineering? It's, it's either solving problems or making good situations better to a certain degree. And I like to consider myself an optimist. I think the best technologists are often optimists. And what we took as a luxury in the past becomes a necessity in the future. Sometimes the technology can get so good, can get so exciting that you worry what people might do with that technology. And I think the one that a lot of people are talking about that I personally am a little like frightened, frightened or certainly concerned about is the concept of deep fakes. The ability that through deep learning and artificial intelligence, you can take my, uh, basically this video right here and all the mannerisms and everything, and superimpose something being spoken by Barack Obama or something like that, where it's almost like I'm doing an imitation of Barack Obama or he's doing an imitation of me. And you can see how the inability to identify the fidelity of the source of the information can be really critical. We need some sort of digital watermark. The ability for computer vision to look at me right now and not only be able to tell that I'm in my 40s and I'm of Indian descent or anything like that and I'm a highly excitable guy, but also be able to see when I'm happy, be able to see when I'm sad, be able to see if I'm really focused and paying attention or if I'm looking down at my phone. What computer vision theoretically could do is have you watch a movie, a TV show, a comedy bit or anything like that and actually measure the sentiment to be able to determine you know what, he's engaged or he's looking the other way or he's laughing at that joke and not at that joke. Once upon a time, machine language, artificial intelligence was the domain of a very few set of technologists that were able to do. It was a very specialized piece. There were a lot of things that you needed to do to almost like hand roll it yourself. And I think one of the things that we're starting to see that's really interesting is that the same way that cloud service providers had created a lot of these tools so anybody could put a website up on the internet as opposed to 25 years ago, I think the same sorts of abstractions are starting to occur around machine learning, around big data, around artificial intelligence, that the, the amazing you know, uh, on oncology scientist that's trying to solve cancer can use these things but also the person in media that just wants to be able to do a choose your own adventure. Zoom has become a word like Google. We've gotten to the point where we, we're genericizing and right, you can be on a Google Hangout and you're still Zooming. And I do think there's value in face-to-face. -face. I do think there's value in human interaction. This has been the hardest stretch of my career from a techno collaborative sort of standpoint. The idea of not being in the same room. I talk about the whiteboard moment. So as, as much as you have the light bulb and the aha moments, you know, I, I'm always mindful of the fact that no idea that's ever happened that's grown into a great idea starts the way it ends. I've told this a lot of young entrepreneurs that I work with, you still need a whiteboard. You still need that one-to-one, -one, you still need you know, um, Nala's in Palo Alto to have a beer and talk about things and catch a game and say, hey, you know, I've been thinking about an idea, right? The phrase of back of the napkin will always exist. The devices, the technology, the capability, we're gonna get these voices out there. They're gonna help be able to make change like we've never seen before. And the diversity of those voices on top of that because the technology is reaching more and more people. It's not just the toy of the elite, although frankly, we still need to solve a little bit of that digital divide problem. But in some ways with iPhones, it's gotten better and better, certainly with smartphones, 
I'm excited to see how that plays out because I think that's going to change the world for the better. <laughs>